Thank you, Steffi. It's an honor to be here. I would like to share with you today what matters most for business success, for startup success, for any business. I try and synthesize what I've learned over the years in starting more than 125 companies. Very quickly, I want to give you a quick background of the business career I've had so you can see what informs the conclusions that I'll share with you. So first off, I've been starting businesses all my life. My very first one was 12 years old selling candy at the bus stop. I took this little Pan Am bag, filled it with candy bars. The student store at school sold candy bars for 10 cents. I undercut them by selling them for nine cents. I bought them three for a quarter, eight and a third cents each at the pharmacy. So I was making a handy two thirds of a cent on each candy bar. But over my junior high school years, I made $400. It was a very exciting, invigorating experience for me. When I got to high school, I started my second business. It was 1973 when the energy crisis, the oil embargo was going on, and there was gas rationing in California, and you only could buy $5 of gasoline on odd or even number days based on the last digit of your license plate. So I thought, wow, solar energy is going to be the answer to solve this problem. So I started making little solar devices, little parabolic concentrators, little plans and kits. And I took out ads in the back of Popular Science magazine to sell those plans for $4. And over the next few years, I sold 10,000 copies. So I made $40,000, and I paid my way through college with that. Maybe even got accepted to college because of that. I went to Caltech, and while in college, I continued that business and then became really, really addicted to high-end audio. And Caltech helped teach me how to design loudspeakers. I had audio engineering classes, and I made this loudspeaker design. I got a patent on this design, and I began manufacturing these speakers and selling them to students on campus and professors nearby. When I graduated from Caltech, literally the month I graduated was the day the IBM PC came out. So I ran down to my computer land store in Pasadena, bought an IBM PC to computerize my business, began to teach myself how to program, and then I started making software to work with Lotus 123 to improve accounting software, and eventually made a natural language interface to Lotus 123. And then Lotus acquired our company, our little small company, when I was 25 years old for $10 million, and I moved back to Boston to work with Lotus in Cambridge. At the time, Lotus was the biggest software company in the world. So I learned a lot about the software industry at Lotus. I had signed a one-year contract, but they kept renewing it. I stayed there for six and a half years and learned everything I could about the software industry from Lotus. And I would have stayed there longer, but then my son started kindergarten. My five-year-old son, I waved goodbye to him on the playground one day and saw, thought, I wonder if he's going to fall in love with learning. I had a magical fourth grade teacher that helped me fall in love with learning. I wonder if he'll have that. If he doesn't, maybe I can make software that helps kids fa fall in love with learning. So I started Knowledge Venture to make multimedia CD-ROMs to help children fall in love with learning. At the time, there was Math, Rabbit and Reader Bla uh, Math Blaster and Reader Rabbit, but they were skill and drill software. They gave kids practice in things they already knew. What I wanted to do was teach kids new things and have them have that aha moment. So that's what Knowledge Venture was about. We built that company up. We sold that company for $90 million in 1995, and then once again, by complete coincidence, literally on my birthday in 1995, Netscape had its IPO, and I read that they had 30 million browsers. And there were 50 million internet users around the world, but 30 million browsers, were, 30 million people were using Netscape. And I saw an unbelievable opportunity to make companies where you could have one-one -one interaction with your customer. And Ben Horowitz was talking uh, the other day about how people laughed him out of the room when he talked about the power of Netscape, but didn't laugh me out of the room. I thought it was incredible. And I decided to start a whole business just to make businesses taking advantage of the Netscape browser. So I started Idealab as a technology incubator in 1996 just to make companies taking advantage of this internet revolution. And since then, we built up all the resources to build companies, multiple companies under one roof. We have all the shared services we need. And we had 12 ideas. Our first year in business, we were going to start 12 companies. We would put $250,000 into each one of them and see if we could raise additional capital after that. And these were our first 12 ideas. One of <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and we started these first companies, and of the 12, five of them failed, but seven of them were able to raise additional capital beyond our additional $250,000. And then a few of them went on to go public and become very successful long-term companies. Since then, we started more than 125 companies over the last 18 years. And across all of those companies, we helped them raise more than $3.5 billion across all of them. We had 45 successful acquisitions and IPOs. 
Seven of them turned into more than billion dollar companies. We have 30 current operating companies, but if you do the subtraction, that means we had 50 failures. So we learned a lot from those failures. And that's what I'm gonna try and synthesize for you today into some lessons about what works and what doesn't and what matters most. The thing I'm most proud of is across all the companies, we created 10,000 jobs. And especially bringing a lot of jobs to Southern California. We're located right in Pasadena, near Caltech. We're very proud of that. So now, what can I tell you about this? How do I extract all those, uh, all those experiences into some simple learnings? So I read this book recently from Peter Thiel, um, where everybody's looking for a formula. He even says at the beginning of the book, there is no simple formula because each new big, bold idea is going to do something innovative that hasn't been done before. And therefore, you can't look to the past to see what, what's going to work going forward. He says, the next Bill Gates won't be building an operating system. The, the next Larry Page won't make a search engine. The next Mark Zuckerberg won't make a social network. So how can you figure out what to do next? How can you figure out some things to apply to your business? So I tried to look at these things. The idea, and not just the idea, but how novelty or how differentiable it is. Is there a unique truth in the idea, the way Peter Thiel talks? Are there competitive moats you can build around it? The team and the execution, how efficient is the team? How effective is it? How adaptable? I, at first, I used to think when I started Idea Lab, in fact, I called it Idea Lab because I thought the idea was the most important thing. But then I began to think maybe the team or the execution mattered more because the idea is going to morph. And I look back at the teams who made our company successful, and sometimes it was just the CEO, the per perseverance of the CEO. Sometimes it was the synergy of the whole management team. The business model. Some, sometimes I thought, some years I even thought, that maybe the business model was the most important thing. Do you have a clear path to revenues? Sometimes I thought the funding mattered the most. Companies that could out, out money raise the other would succeed better than the ones that couldn't. And then finally, the timing. I started a lot of companies that were way too early. Sometimes they were early, sometimes they were too late. Did that matter a lot? So I tried to actually analyze this. So what I did is I looked at all 125 of our companies and 125 companies that weren't ours. And I tried to pick 10 in each category, five companies that turned into billion dollar companies, and five companies that we thought would be billion dollar companies that failed. And the same thing for the 125 companies that aren't ours, five companies that turned into billion dollar companies and five companies everybody thought would be billion dollar companies and failed and ranked them on all of these attributes. So I took a look at these companies here. So uh, some of the companies that we started that did turn into billion dollar companies were City Search, Cars Direct, Overture, Net Zero, Tickets.com. Some of the ones we started that we hoped would be $10 billion companies that completely went out of business were Z.com, Insider Pages, My Life, Intranets, People Link. And then the outside companies I looked at. The five companies I picked to look at that were billion dollar successes were Airbnb, Instagram, Uber, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And the five companies that everybody thought would be billion dollar companies that failed were Webvan, Cosmo, Pets.com, Flues, and Friendster. And I ranked all of these companies on all those measures I told you earlier to try and figure out what variables accounted more for the successes that also weren't present in the failures. And the results were very surprising to me. Now, of course, this is just subjective. It's me looking at this, but I looked at a lot of companies. And I was very surprised with the results, which I'll share with you now, and I'll explain them to you. The number one thing that mattered was timing. Timing accounted for 42% of the successes, of the, of the determination of successes relative to failures. Number two was team and execution. Number three was the idea. How powerful was the idea? Number four was business model, and last was funding. So now let me explain these to you. So funding mattered the least because you can make a company succeed even if you don't raise a lot of money. If your idea is powerful and important, the money is almost the least differentiator in your success. The business model, rank kind of low because you might start out a business without a business model, but you could add one later if you have fundamental customer demand. So take Facebook as an example, I remember, and even Twitter. Remember people laughing at both of those early on because they didn't have a business model, but they developed a business model afterwards. So if you have something that customers really want and you have huge product market fit and pull of your product, you can add a business model later. So I don't think that's essential to have on the first day. The idea, well I used to think the idea was the most important thing, but here's why it comes in third. You morph the idea. The market is going to change your idea. In fact, there's a funny line uh, from Mike Tyson. I, I never thought I'd be quoting Mike Tyson, the boxer, at a business conference like this, but uh, he has a line that says, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. And business is a lot like that. <laughs> Business is like that because you have your whole plan and then you go out to market and it's like getting punched in the face with the way the market actually reacts to your product. It's not what you expected. So your plan is good, but it's going to change. You have to adapt to those punches that are coming at you. 
So team and execution, for a while I thought that was the most important thing because the team is the one who has to look at the market and adapt their product and, and listen carefully and adjust things. And if you don't have a good team, that's not going to happen. And you need a complementary team too. But now why did timing come out on top? I started so many ideas that were way too early. They were great ideas, but the market wasn't ready for them yet. Some ideas that were perfectly timed. I mean, even take Airbnb as one example of the ones I put in the positive side. Airbnb, everybody thinks, is an incredible business model, and it is a pretty good business model. But Airbnb had been done multiple times before Airbnb. One of the things that accounted for Airbnb's huge success is it came out right when the huge recession was on in the United States and around the world. And people needed extra money badly. Uber was similar. Uber's timing was similar to that. So that people were willing to rent out their rooms or their homes. In fact, some, some investors famously passed on Airbnb saying no one's going to ever rent out their home. Well, people did because they needed the money so badly. We had a company that we started called GoTo.com. It, people laughed at that idea, the idea of selling results in a search engine, pay-per-click. Uh, people hated that idea, but the demand was really strong because there was so many businesses that needed a way to buy cost-effective traffic to their website, so the timing was really, really good. So timing sometimes trumps everything. We even started a company, one of our companies that failed, Z.com. We started it in 2000 because we had a bunch of successful e-commerce companies. Being based in Los Angeles, we saw that entertainment was going to move online. So we raised $10 million. We started signing up artists and co comedians to make exclusive content for us. I personally negotiated with Chris Rock and signed a million dollar contract plus equity in the company to make exclusive content for us for five years with Adam Sandler and so on. We had great stuff. It was a forerunner to YouTube or Funny or Die or many great content sites, but broadband penetration was only 12% in the United States at that time. There was no Adobe Flash, uh, there was no player, so you had to download codecs to watch the video. So we had all this great content that nobody could watch. We were just too early. If we could have lasted maybe three years longer till those changes in the marketplace happened, we would have been very, very successful. Instead, we went out of business. So I think timing really is much more instrumental in company success than people realize. So what can you do about it? Because sometimes it's just luck. But what you can do about it is you can actually look at your business and the take up of your product and the dynamics of the marketplace and of your customer to see if they're really ready for what you have and adjust your offering to be what they actually need right now or adjust your burn rate so you can last long enough till you're there when the market is actually ready for what you have. So summarizing this together, uh, I, I would say some of the reasons why, why uh, uh, the inter business opportunity is so great right now is because there's permissionless innovation. All of the new platforms that are being developed today, almost all of them, compared to the old days, you don't need to go ask anybody for permission to invent something. The mobile revolution that you can reach the whole planet. I talked about how there were 50 million internet users in 1995 when we started Idealab. Today there's 2 billion and another billion being added next year. The 50 million users back then were online for 5 or 10 minutes a day. The, the 2 billion users today are online 5 hours a day. So there's a huge multiplier of available time that you can make impact on in the world with your ideas. You can reach the whole planet. The smartphones are going to 4 billion. We're going to have more than half the planet covered in just a few years. And look at this. This is, this is unbelievable. It used to take 20 years for a traditional Fortune 500 company to reach a billion dollar valuation. It took Google five years. It took Facebook six years. It took Tesla four years. It took WhatsApp two years. And it took Waze a year and a half to reach a billion dollar valuation. Now, it doesn't mean that the whole goal is to reach a billion dollar valuation. But this just shows the impact you could have in a shorter and shorter time if you make something that is timed properly that the market really needs, and because of the wide reach that you have today, it's just unbelievable how much impact you can have. So to summarize all the things I learned in as fast as possible in these five final bullets, I look for ideas everywhere, especially things that matter to me personally, because every business is going to face big challenges, and you need to have passion to make it through those tough times. Number two, test, test, test. If you're going to be more adaptive, you need to test your ideas very early on to see if the market is ready for your idea. Number three, listen, listen, listen. This is the thing that small companies can do better than big companies. Big companies have money, have revenues, have people, have brand, but they can't maneuver and pay attention to the customer as well as a small company can. This is one of the big advantages a small company can take advantage of. Number four, acquire complementary skills. That's what I saw in all the management teams when I look back at our companies. The ones that succeeded had complementary skill set at the top of the company. Not just one person who was great, but a, but a complementary team. And I didn't learn that until much later in life to surround myself with other people who didn't share the same skills as me, but to build that complementary team. And then finally, stick with it. Some of the ideas that we had that were laughed at at the beginning, 
were great later on if you can stick with it till the market is ready. And I have this quote on here that I just think is so great. We have it on the wall in our building. All truth passes through three stages. First, it's ridiculed. Second, it's violently opposed. Third, it's accepted as being self-evident. Well, if you can take your bold new idea and stick with it till it's accepted as self-evident, you'll make a permanent positive change in the world. And that's what I think entrepreneurship is all about. So I'm so excited to be a part of that. I'd love to continue the conversation with you. You can reach me, Bill at Idealab.com, or follow me at Twitter. Um, if you're ever in Southern California, I'd love to show you Idealab. I'd love to have you come by and see how we do this and operate. If any of you know a great CEO that would love to work with us to help us build a great company, I'd love an introduction. And I'd love to spend more time with you while we're here. Thank you very much. You've been a great audience. Mm -hmm.